want to welcome everyone to an event on uh, perspectives on uh, uh, global uh, location and U.S. economic growth. Uh, I first of all apologize for the little bit of the overflow crowd. We ended up getting a, a large number of very last minute RSVPs and a very small number of cancellations. So uh, there should be some chairs over there. There may be some other chairs over there. So again, apologize for the tight space. Uh, I also want to, uh, by the way, I should mention I'm Rob Atkinson, I'm president of ITIF. I should also mention that unfortunately this weekend um, we heard uh, from John Rosenberg, Paul Tom, that he was not able to make it to DC. He had some matters that prevented him from being able to make the trip. Um, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that we're uh, uh, honored to have a replacement, uh, Greg Farmer, who's with Qualcomm and has also a very uh, unique background that speaks specifically to this. So I'm going to start off with introducing our speakers. I'll make a few opening remarks. We'll hear from each of our presenters for probably seven minutes or so. We'll then have a dialogue amongst, uh, amongst the speakers, and then we should have plenty of time for questions uh, at the end, and we'll adjourn precisely uh, by 1.30. Um, we start with uh, Jennifer Daniels. Um, Jennifer is the general counsel for the NCR Corporation, which uh, I'm going to do a little quick quiz. If you know what NCR stands for, raise your hand. Okay, I think the median age of the people who are over 55. <laughs> National Cash Register Corporation, one of America's oldest companies, and really one of our first high-tech companies, was established in Dayton, I think back in 1880. 1880. That's not bad. Not, not bad. Um, they are now uh, a leading uh, company that makes a wide array of, uh, of uh, technology, IT equipment, including most prominently what you would see would be uh, kiosks that you would see at banks and things like that. Uh, Jennifer is, um, as I said, senior vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary for NCR. She's responsible for all legal matters in the company. Uh, prior to that, she was Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of Barnes & Noble, and I think um, got off just at the right time. <laughs> we're all going we're all gonna to have e-books soon, so... Uh, um, and before that, served uh, for 16 years with IBM, uh, holding different positions, including Vice President, General Counsel for IBM Americas, Assistant General Counsel for Litigation and others. She also has been an attorney in two private law firms in New York and is a graduate with distinction from Harvard Law School. Uh, I will introduce uh, Greg Farmer next. Um, Greg is the Vice President for Government Affairs for Qualcomm Corporation, which is, uh, again, the most of you know, one of the leading wireless companies in the world. Uh, in that capacity, he leads uh, Qualcomm's Washington, D.C. office with a particular focus on innovation and competitiveness. Uh, prior uh, to that, he was the senior vice president for government relations at Mortel. Uh, Greg was also, uh, also we have two undersecretaries on the panel today, or a former undersecretary uh, in the Clinton administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, where he convened the first ministerial to help uh, map a regional economic strategy for the Western Hemisphere, among many other things. And also, interestingly, Greg, prior to that, was the Secretary of Commerce for the state of Florida. So he brings a real perspective on how states uh, look at this question and how that's uh, up until now been slightly different than how the federal government uh, has looked at it. And Greg earned his master's degree from uh, Florida State University. And um, we are just uh, pleased to be joined by Undersecretary Francisco Sanchez. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Undersecretary Sanchez is the uh, Undersecretary for International Trade at the U.S. Department of Commerce, a post he has held since the President appointed him in 2009. Uh, the ITA has over 2,400 employees and uh, offices in 72 countries around the world. Uh, Undersecretary Sanchez leads efforts uh, at Commerce to improve the global business environment uh, by helping U.S. companies compete abroad. He is also one of the architects of President Obama's uh, National Export Initiative, which set the goal of doubling exports by 2014, of which we are on track to do. Um, since his term uh, at ITA, uh, at Commerce, ITA has successfully assisted more than 15,000 companies, leading to 47,000 uh, export successes. Uh, during the Clinton administration, um, he was Assistant Secretary for Aviation and International Affairs at the Department of Transportation. 
was also a White House Special Assistant and was Chief of Staff to the Special Envoys for the Americas. Uh, he is also a native of Florida uh, and received his Master's in Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. So with that, um, let me just start off by framing the discussion today. Uh, and again, for those of you who just joined us, I apologize for the tight space. Uh, we had a lot more RSVPs than we expected at the last minute. So this notion of competing for industry is not something new. In fact, if you go back and look at American history, there's a sort of uh, iconic program that was started back in the 1930s by Mississippi, which was the first state in the country to actually establish a industrial uh, ret a retention and attraction program. It was a program called Balanced Industry with Agriculture. And Mississippi in the Great Depression was saying, well, we're this kind of agricultural economy, we've got to get industry, and so we're going to establish a strategy and an effort to go out and attract, not at the time, multinational companies, but national companies, companies that were in the north, to come down to the south. And now, 75 or 80 years after that, what we see now is that the race is not between Mississippi and New York, the race is between the United States and other countries. And as my colleague Stephen Azell and I wrote in a book this fall, uh, innovation economics, the race for global advantage, what we're seeing is country after country is putting in place a sophisticated set of policies on the tax side, on the investment side, on the workforce side, uh, to attract and retain the best and most high value added global investment they can. A lot is at stake, according to a recent IBM study uh, that, that benchmarks uh, FDI around the world, they estimated that almost a million jobs were created by FDI in 2010. UNCTEG has come out with their report, the United Nations Committee on Trade and, Economic and, and Development. They estimate this year there'll be $1.4 trillion in foreign direct investment. Uh, they also estimate that this year will be the first time in world history where there's more FDI in developing countries than in developed countries. So we're turning this, this watershed moment, if you will. Well, why is this happening? Why is that such a big part of the global economy today? Uh, it's really two, re two factors. One is about the, the evolution of global production systems, everything from the container ship uh, to uh, ICT control and communication systems that basically allow companies to be global, to manage global supply chain and production systems. Uh, that really was very difficult to do, even uh, early in the early 1990s. It's only in the last decade where that's become easy to do. But it's not just that it's easy to do, it's that, as I said, companies, countries are wanting to do it. What we see now are locations around the world that are working systemically to understand, improve, and promote their unique value proposition to investors. They're not just sitting back and hoping that somebody knocks on the door. They're looking at what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and trying to maximize the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. So who's doing well? What we're seeing now is that uh, countries uh, all around the world are getting more and more investment, as I mentioned in the developing world. But for example, last in the, just in the last year, Indonesia expanded its FDI, inward FDI, uh, by 80%. Uh, countries now that you wouldn't might have thought about a few years ago, Cambodia, Mir Miramar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam uh, have grown their FDI significantly. Even China, with a lot of people write off as China's getting to the, uh, to the middle income trap, uh, China's making significant efforts now to open up the interior of its country through transportation and other infrastructure improvements to access hundreds of millions of low-skill, low-wage workers there so that foreign direct investment can happen. So how's the U.S. doing? Well, frankly, the U.S. Uh, has not been doing well over the last decade. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of turnaround in the last few years because of some onshoring that's happening, but we still face a very, very tough challenge. Uh, overall, in the last uh, 15 years, uh, foreign direct investment coming into the United States uh, is up uh, very, very little. Uh, and most of that FDI, which is not really something that has been talked about very much, most of that FDI is actually uh, not Greenfield FDI. In other words, uh, there are two kinds of FDI coming to a country. A company comes in, they say, we want to open up a factory, a research laboratory, an office. And then there's, we want to acquire a U.S. company. In fact, what's happened is uh, 
uh, Greenfield uh, in 2008 was just 7% of FDI coming to our, our country, uh, one of the lowest rates ever. So we have some real, real challenges. Uh, we've also posted a lower increase in FDI uh, in the last, uh, uh, essentially between 95 and 99, in 2000 and 2009, so sort of that 10 year period, uh, the BRIC countries and the OECD overall outperformed the U.S. So I think increasingly policymakers are aware of these challenges. We're seeing efforts by the Obama administration, we're seeing efforts in Congress to say, wait a minute, we're competing now, we want to get those best jobs in the world, we want to make sure that they're going to be retained here and attracted here, what do we need to do to hear about that? So we'll start uh, with a perspective from uh, from the two private sector <coughs> representatives, and then we'll hear from from the government. So with that, uh, Jennifer. Well, thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. So let me start by telling you a little bit about NCR, because there are only a few hands that went up in the room who know what National Cash Register is. Um, you probably touch our technology every day. Um, we are 128 years old. We used to be headquartered in Dayton, Ohio. We are now in Duluth, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. But if you take money out of an ATM, if you check in for a flight at Reagan at a kiosk, if you buy an Amtrak ticket at Union Station, if you download to your mobile phone a Fandango movie ticket on your smartphone, or if you buy groceries or merchandise at almost any major retailer in the country, you are touching NCR technology. We are the biggest provider of ATMs in the world. We also have substantial point of sale systems and restaurant systems at everywhere from McDonald's to Chick-fil-A. So you probably touch NCR technology every day and you just don't know it. We have about 25,000 employees and about a third of them are here in the States. And what you hear in the news is that multinational corporations like us, we operate in 100 countries or so, that we are all about low cost, that we are all about putting jobs overseas to lower cost. And that is not at all how we think about it in NCR. Some of our biggest competitors are from outside the US. Companies like Winpor in Germany, Fujitsu in Japan, GRG in China, Herto in Brazil, and our goal is to bring the most innovative products and solutions to our customers around the globe. And we were one of the first global com companies in, in the universe, frankly. We are, we are been global for a very long time. There are wonderful old photos of us doing business around the globe for quite some time. But if you're gonna bring those kind of solutions to your customers in those markets, you need to be close to those markets. So it's not surprising that we have developed a global manufacturing footprint to bring our products and solutions to our customers. Just think of ATMs, they're big, heavy things. So making them in Hungary is much more both cost-effective to get them to Europe, but it's also better in terms of innovating with your customers. It's easier to bring a customer into your manufacturing plant, a European customer into your plant in Hungary to show them how you develop it and to get some ideas about how you could do it better. So we have a global footprint not because it's cheaper to manufacture across the globe, because it's better for our business to manufacture across the globe, and because to compete against the competitors we have around the globe, it requires us to have that footprint. But beyond that, we see our manufacturing as a differentiator for us from a competitive basis. And I want to tell you a little story about a sort of recent venture for us in October of 2009, we made a decision to do some onshoring. So in October of 2009, we partnered with the great state of Georgia to work together to bring 900 jobs to Georgia by opening a new manufacturing plant in Columbus, Georgia. That plant was a refurbishment of an existing plant, and Georgia worked with us with tax incentives, with a great program they have in Georgia called Quick Start, which helps you train new employees when you bring them into your enterprise. With university partnerships, think of Georgia Tech, great university partnerships in terms of technology, private sector and public coming together to bring innovation to the market. And with a really robust infrastructure in Georgia that supports global business. 
So we now have a new LEED certified green manufacturing manufacturing facility in Columbus, Georgia that we're very proud of and that brought 900 jobs to Georgia and that we were able to do because Georgia sat down with us and partnered with us to do it. We also have a great education center that we opened in Peachtree City in Georgia where we bring all of our CEs, that's what we call them, they're customer engineers. So we not only manufacture products, but we service those products around the globe. So again, in order for us to service those products, we need those engineers in the geographies where we operate. We bring those, all of those CEs from around the globe into Georgia for their training. They fly into Hartsfield, they come to Peachtree City, and they are trained in that facility in Georgia. And that was because of the great partnership between government and the private sector to get that done. And that's what I'd love to encourage at the federal level. We'd like to encourage our leaders in Washington to think about things like tax reform and how to incent that investment here in the US. Right now, from our perspective, the playing field isn't level. I'm sure you all know that the United States has among the highest corporate tax rates in the world. Some would say the highest, but it depends who's counting. Uh, we have a global tax system that makes it very difficult for us to move our overseas profits here to the US for investment. And we're very pleased that the Obama administration recognizes that corporate tax rates must come down. We think they could come down a little lower than 28%. We'd like to see them something closer to the OECD average of about 25%. We were very pleased to see a proposal to make the R&D tax credit permanent. That's something we think about every year. And let me drop a little footnote here about stability in the tax system. Think about your own, your own personal finance. If every year you have to think about, are the rules gonna change? You're more conservative in what investments you make. At least I am, I have kids who are about to go off to college. And if I think the tax laws might change, I am a little bit more conservative about how I might make my own personal investments if I'm not sure what the rules are gonna be. And I think anything that drives us towards more certainty in the tax system, and we're quite happy to see the current proposal would make the R&D tax credit permanent, <coughs> will really drive investment and drive additional jobs here in the US. One of the main reasons that this is really important is one that Rob mentioned, which is there's really intense competition from countries outside the US for investment. When you mention that you're gonna open a new plant or start a new line of business, the phone starts to ring from countries around the globe saying, why not put it here? Bring your business here and we will give you the following incentives. So that's, that's something that really goes on in the world that I think is absolutely meaningful when companies are trying to decide where they need to invest. I would tell you at NCR, we think about investing near our customers, but it's, it's really true that countries around the globe are competing for investment. More importantly, a trend that we're seeing, and we're seeing it more recently, that I think really puts a highlight on why this is important, um, is sort of what I call forced localization or indigenous innovation policies. These used to be a little bit more few and far between. You'd see them in countries like China or Nigeria, but we're now seeing them really come up across the globe. So what am I talking about? These are policies put in place by governments that basically favor their own local manufacturing and their own local technology. So let me give you a couple examples. In February of 2012, the Indian government issued a new Buy India policy, it's called the PMA. And the goal of that policy is to favor Indian electronics manufacturers in Indian public sector procurement. Argentina now has a dollar for dollar import export balancing requirement. They must match dollar for dollar if you're gonna do business in Argentina. And equally, we've seen in Brazil similar policies that favor local providers, and we happen to have some manufacturing in Brazil, favor local providers over people who are bringing things in from outside the country. So what does that mean if you're a company like us? What that means is if I wanna go compete in one of those countries, and frankly, we have to compete globally. American companies no longer cannot compete on a global stage. I mean, Thomas Friedman told us in 2005, the world is flat, and I can tell you I live that every single day. So in order to compete globally in a country that has that kind of indigenous innovation requirement, I got a couple of options. One is to go there and invest there, and become someone who they view as indigenous. I might be an American company, but if I set up 
an entity in that country, I might get the benefit of being indigenous and treated in the same way their local providers are. So that's a way, without simply putting incentives on the table, that countries around the globe are incenting us to look at different ways to deliver solutions to our, cu uh, to our customers. So I, I think I'd just like to quickly close, because we're trying to keep the remarks short, is with the following. A healthy NCR globally means more jobs here. So if our company is doing well, and to do well, we need to do well around the globe, it means we will invest here. I'll give you one small example. Last year, we bought a company called Radiant Systems in Georgia. <coughs> Radiant Systems provides hospitality systems at stadiums and at restaurants. Think of the system at a McDonald's restaurant where the order up at the front matches up with an order in the back. They know when you order a Big Mac in the front, they're making your Big Mac without cheese in the back. That's the kind of system that, that they have. Um, we bought that company last year. They were not very global, and they want to expand their business globally. The expansion of their business globally is driving the creation of jobs here in the States. We are expanding the support for that business here in the States. We're also expanding some globally as well. But when we're healthy as a global company, it means more and better jobs here. So I think I would leave it there, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Thank you, and thank you, Rob, for that kind introduction, and thank you for putting together such an interesting panel that's so important to creating jobs in the future in the whole high-tech global industry. Qualcomm <coughs> has 26,000 employees, the majority of which are right here in the United States. Just to give you a little brief background, because most of you probably don't know what we do, but most of you probably have a smartphone, a tablet, an e-reader, or other mobile device. We make the chipsets and the <coughs> software that makes those things smart. They're enhancing the way we live every day, and it's the, our chips that really make that happen. Our business model is interesting. Part of it is making the chips, keeping the technology ahead, but second, we broadly license our portfolio of U.S. patents to virtually every manufacturer in the mobile industry. And then we reinvest about 20% of that revenue back into future R&D. We call it the virtuous cycle. We create the product, we license the product, and we reinvent new products. So we're constantly changing to make it better. Part of being really important in our success formula is the strong intellectual property systems of the U.S. Without that, the value of the, of the innovations and the licensing would not be successful. Our technology is at the chips of the core of mobile devices worldwide, and it is growing phenomenally. Right now, that mobile phone is the largest technology and information platform in the world. In a world of 7 billion people, there are 6 billion mobile devices connected right now. It has been transforming the way we live globally. Whole societies have been changed virtually in years by the introduction of mobile technology. Think about the various things we do with our smartphone today. Think about how it's changed our lives. It's become a remote control. All kinds of things we would have never dreamed of just a few years ago, and it's just begun. Every facet of our lives, our businesses, education, and our health is going to be greatly impacted by this technology. And again, no country in the world has been as innovative and had the amazing record as America. The key is to keep that going. So how do we continue to foster that tradition of technological leadership? We believe the government needs to work with the private sector to put together the kinds of policies to ensure that the innovation economy continues to go, grow. What does that mean? The sort of investments that gave birth to Qualcomm just a quarter of a century ago made this successful. How was this done? How did the company start? It started with a group of professors at a public university that created the company 
by pursuing and succeeding getting some federal grants. So together, we can foster the future. Now, there are a few things that the government did that helped us grow in the early days. It allowed wireless operators to deploy the technology of their choice, to put the technology into the hands of the consumers. We welcomed immigrants into our country, brought many of the best and the brightest to our shores. What is needed for our government to encourage to drive in these areas? Well, there's a few things. One is, we believe, the use of mobile technology in K through 12 education can help drive student interests in STEM degrees and careers. We need to keep the talented innovators here. We find that the postgraduate level, we find engineers, programmers, scientists, and managers are often not union citizens, uh, United States citizens. They're foreign students who want to remain here, participate, contribute, and not be sent home to develop a company that competes against us. This is not a challenging concept. It's very simple, and it should be done. When I was Secretary of Commerce in the state of Florida, I had a toolbox of incentives I could use to recruit, retain, or grow an industry. There were formulas that said, if you come into Florida and you create value-added, high-paying jobs, we can work with you. Certify the jobs, and we can do tax incentives, credits, or other programs. We can work on infrastructure. If you're going to build something significant, that's going to employ a lot of people who have developed tax space, we can perhaps do a road from the freeway to your facility. There was a toolbox, a kit, that you could take things, put them together, and make it work. Up until this administration, that did not exist at the federal level. Other countries had it, but we did not. I tip my hat to the Obama administration for creating Select USA. For the first time in history, we now have an entity that tries to recruit and retain and grow jobs internationally. <clears throat> However, it's, even though it started, and it's not even two years old now, it needs a bigger toolkit. It needs more visibility and more things in there so that we can force the growth and be competitive with other countries. Uh, Jennifer's absolutely right. When we decided a few years ago to build a fab facility, we had companies come in to see our CFO and said, here's what we'll do. We'll give you this, 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 and this. Sometimes they had slick professional PowerPoint presentations. United States, silence. We have an opportunity with this administration to change all that. And I, hopefully it is done. So again, in, in, in summary, if we can continue to protect our patents, if we can do an intelligent uh, immigration policy, if we can agree, agree with the corporate tax rate, we can get the corporate tax rate so that we're competitive. The future innovation for this country will be very exciting. Thank you. Rob, thank you very much, and thank you for your earlier introduction of me. Uh, Jennifer, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with you. Uh, I was not aware of some of the products that I use on a daily basis that are from NCR. Uh, unfortunately, I use one of your products all too often, much to the detriment of my checking account. Um, but it's good, it's good to, uh, to learn more about the, some of the innovative products that uh, NCR has. And to my good friend, Greg Farmer. Uh, Greg, I have called a friend now for more than 30 years. In fact, when we first became friends, I think I was probably about 20. And, actually, I think I was more like five. <laughs> Frank, probably, and uh, I would have, somebody had told me that Greg and I were going to be on a panel together 33 years later. I said, are you kidding? We would be too old to do that. And uh, 
now that my view of age has evolved, uh, I realize that we're still very, very young. And it's good, very good to be with you on this panel. Uh, and, and let me thank the uh, ITIF for the very, very important work that you do uh, in promoting innovation in our economy. Uh, I really, uh, when I learned that I had an opportunity to speak to you and, and I got the invitation, I was excited to be able to share with you uh, some perspectives. Uh, this is really, uh, as Jennifer and Greg alluded to, a very fitting time to talk about technology firms. Because we're living in a time of tremendous change. I think the New York Times columnist, uh, Tom Friedman, caught it best when he said a few years ago that literally about five or six years ago, Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was a sound. Uh, the cloud was something in the sky. LinkedIn was a prison. Uh, and applications were something you sent away to college. Uh, so these advances in technology are really fueling jobs and growth, not only in your sector, but really across our economy. The challenge for us, and I think Jennifer and Greg pointed it out quite well, is how do we ensure that the U.S. continues to be a primary home for innovation for many years to come? So today I want to focus my comments on what the Commerce Department is doing to encourage more foreign and domestic investment uh, and to encourage that businesses locate here in the United States, how we're helping companies expand to markets around the world, um, how we are strengthening intellectual property uh, protection across the world, and how we're contributing to make sure that we have a workforce with the skills that they need to meet your industry's needs. Now, historically, foreign countries have done a far better job than we have in attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, Rob made reference to this in his introductory remarks. Um, and the truth is that we have been facing very stiff competition from countries around the world for a very long time. And we, at the least at the federal level, had done very little to stem that competition, or at least to uh, face it. Uh, there may well have been an attitude that here in the United States, we have such a strong market, we have such a strong legal system, we don't really have to do anything, it will show up. Um, that's not the case. It certainly isn't the case now. It probably hasn't been for many, many years. Rob's uh, statistics uh, make that very, very clear. Our competitor countries, are offering federal incentive grants, project-based grants, um, something as simple as a world-class website to make sure you have easy access to information. So recognizing this need, uh, the president stood up about a year and a half ago, Select USA, and uh, a number of the previous speakers made reference to it. Uh, I'm very proud to say that it is housed in the Department of Commerce. And we get our message out that America is the best place to do business. Uh, precisely because of some of the advantages that I just mentioned, that we have an amazing uh, domestic market, that we have a great transparent legal system, that we have a great network of transportation and digital infrastructure, and we have strong protections of intellectual property. Um, and to do this, we're providing uh, companies with a wide, array, a wide array of services. One of the things that uh, Select USA is doing, and I'm very proud of, is we're acting as an ombudsman. If you have a company that is making a significant investment in here, and there are going to be federal regulations or federal agencies are going to have a role to play in it, we will bring those agencies together. Now, we're not going to push them to have a, uh, a certain uh, conclusion on whatever uh, regulatory decisions they need to make, but we are going to push them to act in a timely manner. Uh, a good example of this, uh, literally uh, about 10 days ago, I had the executives of a company uh, from South Africa who's making a, an enormous investment. It is not in your industry, but it is a huge investment, uh, somewhere north of $10 billion, so not insignificant. Uh, and they are going to have a potential uh, business, if you will, with about a half a dozen federal agencies. So we brought all of those agencies together in the Commerce Conference Room representatives from each of those agencies to sit down, number one, hear what this company is proposing, 
and to begin to have an immediate line of communication on how we can move forward and move quickly uh, for two reasons. One, to make it easy for this company to make this very important investment, but two, to send a message to the world that when you do make an investment here, we're serious about cutting red tape, we're serious about helping you make your investment. Um, so I'm very happy to say that we really have already in the brief time, as Greg said, this has been very brief, we've been up for about a year and a half, but in that short time we have supported billions of dollars in foreign direct investment, and we've done so, by the way, with only a fraction of a budget that some of our competitor countries have. Germany spends, outspends us probably 15 to 1. Uh, I'm, I'm estimating that, but I can tell you it is a significant amount. Uh, and like Germany, there are a, a number of other countries that are spending significant amounts of money. Uh, but we're doing it. The president has put his money where his mouth is, and he's included money in the budget. Uh, to stand up a, a more robust staff for Select USA. We're also working with uh, colleagues in other parts of the Department of Commerce on assess costs everywhere. Uh, and through ACE, assess costs everywhere, we help U.S. firms learn the true costs of doing business abroad and we help them bring some of that business back home. Now another thing that's very, very important that we're doing, and it's uh, an area that's very near and dear to my heart, is boosting U.S. exports. Uh, we're helping firms stay more competitive, and ITA is helping them find as many customers in, as possible. And this is, I believe, I, I call myself a trade evangelist. Uh, and I say so with great pride, because 95% of the world's consumers live outside the United States. They do not live here. So if you are not actively going after that 95% of the world's market, it's like having a retail operation in a mall here and only marketing to five out of every 100 customers that walk by your store. We, as an economy, cannot afford to do that. So we're working very, very hard. And I'm happy to say that software and IT services, semiconductors, and other related fields are central. They are high priorities to the President's National Export Initiative. So we're helping high-tech firms of all sizes, we're helping them reach new markets, and we're helping them create jobs and economic growth. And in doing this work, I'm also very happy to report that we have reached record levels of exports in recent years. In 2011, we reached 2.1 trillion in exports. That is a record for the United States, and I'm happy to say that those exports supported nearly 10 million jobs. So we're also expanding opportunities throughout the world uh, through trade policy. And a top priority is expanding product coverage um, with the WTO Information Technology, Technology Agreement. And we're looking for this agreement to include new innovative tech products. And another priority is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, which will outline uh, pro-competitive best practices uh, in IC, ICT services like independent regulatory bodies, technology neutrality, and judicial review of regulatory decisions. Um, the administration also recently uh, notified Congress of its intent to negotiate the International Services Agreement, which will address such issues as cross-border data flows, forced localization of business functions, and Jennifer is absolutely correct, this is a huge problem. Uh, and not only are we trying to tackle it through this agreement, but I can tell you that we work very hard, and especially in the countries that you identified, um, India and Brazil in particular, through what I would call blocking and tackling. It's stuff that isn't necessarily gonna make the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. But every single time that I have an interaction, for example, with my counterpart or my colleagues at USTR uh, have uh, meetings, particularly when we're focused on trade and investment issues, I can assure you that we are hammering away uh, at these issues. Beyond that, though, we believe uh, that the International Services Agreement will go a long way to help us with this kind of non-tariff barrier. We're also looking for equal treatment of private enterprise vis-a-vis state-owned enterprises and state-supported enterprises. Again, I don't need to tell anybody in this room the importance of IP protection. America's ability to compete 
also depends on effective intellectual property uh, protection systems, both here and abroad. And the Commerce Department has made great progress in helping entrepreneurs acquire high quality IP rights and to do so more efficiently. Uh, one example of this is the Leahy Smith America Invents Act, which was signed into law in September of 2011. It has enabled investors of all sizes to protect and patent their technologies at a very, very low cost. So these are very, very important issues to your industry. And I want to just touch on something that Jennifer uh, had mentioned, and that is the importance of taking a look at our tax system relative to countries around the world and make sure we're competitive. And I'm glad that you rightly pointed out the president is committed to lowering the corporate tax rate, to making permanent <coughs> the R&D tax credit, and through that, to make sure that we inject some certainty into our system. Because nothing hurts business, hurts our economy more than uncertainty. <coughs> um, one area um, that I, I want to focus on before I close my remarks, uh, and that is STEM skills. <clears throat> In order to attract cutting edge uh, companies, we have to have a cut cutting edge workforce. Um, DOC, the Department of Commerce, is leading the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation, which is a billion dollar proposal to create up to 15 institutes around the U.S. These institutes will marshal all of the assets in a particular U.S. region to focus on a particular technology or a process that would support manufacturing. And the President uh, has also proposed increased funding for programs that support STEM education. His uh, FY13 budget proposed investing $3 billion in STEM programs across the federal government, which is a 2.6% increase over uh, 2012. And I, I appreciate NCR's uh, efforts in education. And, uh, and I want to talk about one other thing. This was not in my prepared remarks, but Greg, you point out something that's very important, and that is immigration reform. I am really, quite frankly, tired of hearing the stories of very talented folks who come here, study at our universities, and have some interesting ideas that they're quite willing and ready to do right here in our country. But we send them off. And then they go off and do it in other countries and create thousands of new jobs. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we need immigration reform, but I would say that is a pretty important one. So I uh, applaud you, Greg, for raising that issue. And I hope, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I hope that what we have seen in the, in the comments and discussions over the last week or so, uh, that we will see uh, improvement in that in the very near future. So let me close with uh, one of my favorite sayings when I uh, think about your business, and that is that innovation is the ability to convert ideas into invoices. The administration, I want to tell you, is absolutely committed to helping tech companies as much as possible convert their ideas into invoices and to do it right here in the United States. And we're doing this, as I've mentioned throughout my talk, uh, by attracting business here, particularly uh, foreign direct investment, as well as domestic firms, by helping firms find new products around the world through export promotion, uh, by expanding global opportunities through our trade policy efforts, enhancing IP rights, and making sure that we're making the right investments in our workforce. Uh, you all play a very important role in making sure we're on the right track and we're doing the right things that can help you. I look forward to continuing that relationship with you, and I very much look forward to our conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all three of our speakers for those excellent remarks. Um, I want to just ask a couple of questions first and then we'll open it up in just a minute. Um, I do want to talk a, a, a bill that we just uh, uh, supported last week, the I Squared Act by Senators Hatch and Coon, which is a very good high skill that immigration bill moves the ball forward in many ways and uh, hopefully that, that or a component of it will integrate it into the comprehensive if we ever 
do that, which looks more likely than you will. But I want to start, um, Jennifer, you, you talked a little bit about cost and taxes, and I think there's a, a, a little bit of confusion, certainly, I think, in some people's minds. On the one hand, cost is not the only thing. The U.S. is not fundamentally competing on cost, as, say, a country like, like China or Vietnam is. But at the same time, as a recent study we cited uh, uh, by the National, in, in the National Bureau of Economic Research by one scholar who uh, looked at effective tax. It's all clear we have the highest statutory rate in the world. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about effective rates, and some people argue, well, some kind of companies don't pay anything, and our effective rates are quite competitive. And this study showed, or at least asserted to show, that the U.S. had the highest effective tax rate in manufacturing and similar in other kinds of tech industries. Or other industries. Uh, how would you respond to that? So how do we how should and we think about that? And maybe sorry, two mics, but you could use one. I guess I guess it, can you guys hear me? Okay. I guess in a couple of ways. First of all, I don't want the impression to be left that the driving force in the decision making is the tax rate. It's a factor. The driving force in our decision making about where to put manufacturing or where to put jobs generally is where can we put those jobs to be closest to our customers to deliver what our customers want from us, which is robust products and solutions. That's the first factor. Where do we want to put that kind of capability so that we can serve our customers the best? And I think it's important that we not lose sight of the fact, and all of us said it, we have to compete globally. 95% of the consumers in the world are outside of the United States, so U.S. companies have to compete globally. Now, when we decide how we're going to do that, so let's use our manufacturing facility in Hungary. We could have put that many places in Europe. We decided to put it in Budapest. Certainly, when we think about that, we think about tax rate, among other things, as a factor in deciding where we're going to put that facility. So I don't want to put too much of a point on tax. To me, tax is just one factor that one would consider. Tax policy, when I take it up from tax rate to tax policy, I do think there are some pretty robust disincentives in the US tax system. We have a global tax system as opposed to a territorial tax system that does put us in a tough spot in terms of moving our proceeds from around the globe to the place it makes the most sense to invest them in order to serve our customers. So I don't think of it as a, how do I think about the rate question? The rate's one piece of it, but it's really just a small piece of it. I think of it as a policy, uh, policy issue and think of it as how do we enable U.S. companies, multinational companies, to be facile so that they can not have tax disincentives to put business where it makes sense the most sense to in fact put that business and, and our Georgia example is a good one we got wonderful tax incentives from the state of Georgia associated with moving our corporate headquarters there and then also associated with putting our Peachtree City facility to train employees there and our manufacturing facility there so yes that absolutely was meaningful in making that decision but it's not the only driver so I don't want it to, to uh, be cast in that light well, I'll just add to that. I agree with everything Jennifer said. It is certainly not the only factor. But going back to my fat example for you know, when they charge 35% to bring the taxes back into the United States, the math doesn't work in building a new facility because you've taken that much money off the table to begin with. And, and for a company like mine, which reflects the same statistics, 95% plus of our business is outside the United States. So it's a disincentive to build here because of the fact that you've got to pay the higher tax rate under this system. And again, we're the only G8 country in the world that does that. So it's just a, it's a built-in deterrent. So one of the things you hear often about, um, about competition uh, between countries is, is that we, we are, uh, competition is bad and, and it leads to a race to the bottom. Um, and, and yet I think one could argue that competition can lead to a race to the top if it leads us to have better infrastructure, a smarter tax system, like a better <coughs> credit, more investment in skills and the like. Uh, but clearly where, where competition does lead to a race to the bottom, I would argue, is around uh, this, uh, this set of bad policies that countries are, are implementing. And, and Jennifer, you, you highlighted uh, 
India as, as sort of the latest uh, bad boy of, of trade policy, uh, which is hard to do when you have Argentina in as one of your competitors, but they're really working hard to overcome Argentina. Um, I laugh about Argentina, but it's actually quite serious. If you're a, if you're a computer maker uh, and, and you want to sell in Argentina, they actually want you to set up your operations, not just in Argentina, which would be bad enough, but actually in that high-tech hub of Tierra del Fuego. Um, we all know how many uh, innovators are down there. Um, but, you know, all joking aside, this is something that's really, we see as growing quite significantly. The Indians just announced last week that they're going to have a big national fiber optic uh, build, which is good competition. The bad part is only Indian firms are allowed to bid on that contract for equipment, not, not just service provision, but the actual equipment. So maybe under Secretary Sandra, you, you can uh, talk a little bit. I know the administration has a new trade enforcement task force, which again is a first, but perhaps you could uh, share your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. Those are uh, non-tariff barriers that uh, are not helpful to American, uh, this, the American tech sector. I would argue that um, in the medium and short, uh, medium and long term, they're not good for the countries that are implementing them. Of course, that doesn't help us in the short term. Um, in the most, probably the most extreme case right now is Argentina, as you pointed out. And I have great concerns for Argentina that as early as a year from now, I think that their economy will show um, uh, signs of decline, in part because of the policies that they have been promoting. <clears throat> so I think part of the things that we're doing, as I mentioned in my remarks, we're doing the blocking and tackling, which is literally raising these issues every chance we get, making the case not only for our company's interest, but for uh, the uh, countries that we're talking to in their long-term interest. Uh, we didn't mention Indonesia, but Indonesia, we, we recently started a commercial dialogue, uh, which is a venue to talk about trade and investment issues. And one of the first we, things we did under that commercial dialogue was to do a workshop with policymakers of the Indonesian government and the World Bank using the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index and kind of laying out where they stood, which you know is not terribly good. I think that they're at 130 right now out of 180. Um, and it's a, it's a small start. Like I can say that's not going to get the front page of, of any major newspaper or trade publication, but it matters. So we're doing that. Um, the, uh, the services agreement that I mentioned, it begins to lay some very clear standards, uh, I think is also uh, significant. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it is at the forefront of a lot of our trade policy work and we're going to keep plugging away. That's great. I just had a quick commercial. I would highlight a report my colleague Stephen Azell wrote called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Global Innovation Policy, which makes exactly your point that many of these policies are, are what we call ugly. They're bad, bad. They're bad for the world and bad for the country. But educating countries, mm -hmm. that's the why that's the case as far as get a copy of that. Make sure you get one. Um, you know, I, one, one of the things I think that's hard about this issue is that we, we I think, a lot of policymakers still have this view that somehow if we, if we just sort of click our shoes together and wish hard enough, uh, we, we can be in a world where there's no competition and we can just sort of will American companies to be here. Um, I remember this story when I was heading up uh, a long time ago, in the 90s, this Rhode Island Economic Policy Council for the governor, we created a 10-step plan to revitalize the Rhode Island economy and um, included uh, investing in skills and infrastructure, but also some tax incentives like an R&D credit, investment tax credit. We, my my uh, guy who was on my board, the head of the AFL-CIO uh, and I, we went down and were asked to brief the Democratic Senate staff, the Democratic Senate retreat of Rhode Island, which was essentially the entire Senate, if you know Rhode Island. Um, and uh, we finished our, our pitch as to why we encouraged the senators to support our, our package. And the very first question from a senator was, is there any possible way we could help the economy without having to help business? <laughs> I felt bad for him because I understand where he was from. Uh, it was a long, long legacy of, of uh, you know, conflict between business and labor and et cetera, et cetera. And, and unfortunately, uh, and George Nee, to his credit, said, no, there's not. Uh, you know. and, and I think we still have that view. And so how do we do a better job of, of, of educating policymakers that, you know, it's, it's funny, just quickly, you know, we, we mock Engine Charlie Wilson, who back in the 50s when he when was testifying to become Secretary of Defense, uh, he said famously, what's good for GM is good for the U.S., and 
What he also said with people didn't report is what's good for the U.S. is, is good for GM. Um, but people mock that statement. And, and clearly it's not always true. I don't mean to pretend it is, but there's some overlap there. So how do we get that message across that, that there are certain things that are good for U.S. companies that are also good for the U.S. workers and U.S. economy overall? Well, Rob, first let me say that there are more than a few Democrats that would never ask that question. Just for the record. Uh, I, I, for one, get the importance uh, of, of business, certainly to our economy, but really to our overall quality of life. Um, it's really why I get up every morning, is to try to make uh, the environment easier, particularly on a global basis, uh, for business. Um, I, I think that um, one place where we need to start <coughs> in, in talking about the role of, of business and quite the intersection of business and government in a more constructive way is right here in Washington. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, conversation here um, has not been helpful, and, and I'm, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to uh, point fingers. Uh, one because I'm not a rocket scientist, but I'm also not stupid either. I figure I won't get there, but I will say that as a as a proposition. We here in the nation's capital, and this is both the administration, Congress, and stakeholders, including this organization, uh, need to engage in a constructive conversation around tax reform, uh, around immigration, around supporting um, strong uh, trade policy. And I think it happens uh, at certain levels, but I sure like to see us all up our game. And so I would start right here in this city. You know, I would say it's funny. It's it's easy to sort of demonize business, um, and I would tell you that I mean I work in an iconic American company, even though many of you didn't know uh, what NCR meant. I mean, NCR has been around a really long time, and is very proud to have been one of the first U.S technology companies in the world, and I'm sure Qualcomm is very proud of its heritage as well. And I used to work at IBM, and IBM was equally proud of its heritage as an American company. And I appreciate that IBM has probably now 400,000 employees, and I'm not speaking for IBM by any stretch of the imagination, and many of them are outside the U.S. Barnes & Noble, where I was the general counsel, is, again, an iconic brand here in the United States that started from nothing. So I think there's actually more altruism in corporations that I think corporations are ever given credit for. Yes, we are here to maximize value for our shareholders and to bring value to our shareholders, which, oh, by the way, benefits the economy. When our shareholders are doing well, that doesn't mean something evil is going on. That means that people who own our business have money to invest in their businesses. But I do think it, it not only in Washington, in the world, I think there is a sense that corporations are somehow out for themselves. And I can tell you, having worked in a bunch of pretty iconic <coughs> U.S. companies, that we're all very proud of that. Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. only echo that. I think, I, can I just ask you to also, when you talk about that, can you also add in this notion of why the states get this? It's more in the okay, DNA, because sure, sure. we've had that experience directly. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be more than happy to, um, in part because the competition is fun. <laughs> but I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, just picking up on what Jennifer says, you know, too often people look at companies, corporations, and they look at their annual reports and their analyst discussions and an article in the paper saying how they're doing financially. You know, if you just go to the campuses, if you could go to San Diego and walk around there and see the employees there and how excited they are about life and really believe that they're doing things that's going to change the world. That's exciting. I get my batteries charged up when I go there, and I'm not a technical person, but it's just it's just it's just such an intriguing thing. And if we could somehow articulate what the people do, and not to mention all the good we do with culture, with uh, arts, with all kinds of charities across the board, locally and nationally and internationally. And, I could talk about wireless reach for an hour, but I won't. But it, it's, it really is. It's, it's a different face than what a lot of politicians and, quite frankly, a lot of people have. Um, now, back to your question on why states get economic development. You know, first of all, 
you're closer to your customer. You know, people with, with that county commissioner, that state senator, or that business person comes into your office and says, I want to do X, Y, Z. I want to build this facility or I want to expand this facility. Man, it is just the best feeling in the world because you know that you and your team can directly impact not only that company and the employees that's going to work at that company, but that community. I mean, there, the, some of the best days in my life was cutting a ribbon and seeing 500 employees out there that I knew was responsible for some of my activities. And the other thing at the state level is, like I said, up until the Obama administration, you heard silence when it came to any kind of effort to retreat and to bring people into the country, recruit, I meant to say. But at the, at the, at the other level, at the state level, it, it's, it's, it's there, it's front and center, and you can get things done so much easier. I, I tell, with all due respect to the undersecretary, you know, when I was Secretary of Commerce of Florida, you could get an idea of running in the morning, and it could be policy in 25 days. It's a lot harder at the federal level, and it's nobody's fault, it's just sort of the nature of the beast. But at the state level, you can really do it. And again, you're so much closer to the customer. Uh, it, it's, it's, and then, like, and I said it flippantly, but it really is true. You get involved in a big recruitment effort, like I was involved in with the Mercedes SUV facility, and those competitive juices are flowing. You want to win. <laughs> you really want to win. Now, you can't ever lose track of, you know, what you're putting on the table. It has to, <laughs> at the end of the day, be to, to, to the taxpayer's advantage. But you do really, really get those competitive juices flowing, and it's fun. Great. Let me uh, open it up for comments or questions. If you have one, just raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Is there a microphone? Or no? Okay, no microphone. Let me go here and then here. Thank you for hosting us, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Gary Bottor. Every time I attend one of these, I get the feeling that there's no shortage of answers. We have the answers. It's a will to implement. I'll give you one example. My son-in-law just uh, graduated a couple of years ago from Harvard. I went to graduation, and he was the only person whose name I could pronounce in the graduation class. And we know that these people would like to stay here, and we've known it for years, and we're waiting, what, for a total immigration package? Let's solve this one problem together. The Republicans and Democrats could do this. I don't know why we wait on these things. It's good for the country, less doing. Explain that. Why, why can't we just take one piece of a problem and solve it? Uh, Gary, if I had to answer to that, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'd probably be doing something else more lucrative. Uh, <laughs> but, but I will say this. I think that the political, what's that? I, I get upset, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, listen, I get upset too. I, I remember hearing one story of a, uh, a young, uh, young man from India, finished graduate school, was finishing up his, uh, the equivalent of an intern program with a company. He came up with uh, a concept for a business, had investors that were willing to invest in him here in the U.S. But his time was up, he left. He's got his business up and running in India, and I think last I heard, he, he employed 2,000 people. So I get it, and I get just as frustrated as you do. The only thing I would say, without trying to figure out why that is, is that I do believe for the first time in a long time, there is the political will. I think the political stars have aligned. Um, and I think we're gonna get immigration reform that will include <coughs> fixing this problem. So uh, hopefully you won't be as angry next time we meet. Uh, you'll we'll have cause for celebration. There is one uh, right here. Yep. Uh, excuse me. Yes, uh, I'm Alex Lawson with Inside U.S. Trade. I had a question for the Undersecretary. Um, this is with regard to China. Um, Undersecretary Format of the State, Assistant Secretary Lago of Treasury, made some comments in recent weeks basically saying that there's an increased interest uh, in China to invest here, but that they sort of keep uh, policies in place that restrict U.S. investment and that we sort of have to communicate to them that you know, that's not you know, a palatable policy for us. But you know, they, they've sort of hinted at it. Is there any way that the U.S. 
given the strict obligations, can actually adopt you know, sort of our investment policy as any kind of stick towards China to say, we're not going to you know, let you invest here if you don't give us what we want on the policy X. Is that actually, you know, is that, is that something that would seem palatable? And I guess the other part is, would we even be allowed to do that under our WTO obligations? I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Alex. Lawson. Alex. Uh, I, Alex, I would, I would proceed with extreme caution in using uh, investment policy here as a stick because you would be, I think in many ways, uh, number one, setting a bad precedent that goes beyond China, and number two, cutting your nose off to spite your face. Um, because as all three of us have talked about today, it's important that we attract foreign direct investment here. And uh, I, I think that we are better off uh, number one, being a model for uh, foreign direct investment, and quite frankly, we are, in spite of some of the challenges that we've talked about here, whether it's taxes or immigration, we consistently rank in the top five places to invest in the world. Uh, whether you're using the World Bank ease of doing business, whether you're using the WEF ind index or any number of indexes. Um, I, would, I would rather guard that reputation than use investment policy uh, as a stick. Now. Uh, that doesn't say, that doesn't mean that we don't aggressively uh, talk to our partners, including China, and try to work on changes uh, that show some, some equity in terms of investment policy. But I would move with extreme cautious, caution about, about using investment policy as a stick. Uh, I think I was uh, in order I saw them. I was right back there, man. Yeah. You can identify yourself if you're with Maybe you can stand up so we can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Tinson. I am a student at George Washington University, and I intern on the Hill. Um, my question. There are a host of organizations such as the ITIF, NISHA, PTO, and ITA that have made conscientious efforts towards the global contribution of solving the issues regarding the governance of the World Wide Web. We've seen an attempt with the Global Free Internet Act of 2012. What do you feel needs to be proposed legislatively to ensure the United States is the dominant player in controlling the World Wide Web? I'm not sure we want to use the word control. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly we do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think um, this recent round showed very clearly that there's a, there's a clear divide. And, we in, in the internet industry believe that the current system works very well, should be maintained, and um, we're not an interest in turning it over to ITU. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to find anybody in Washington who's pro, <laughs> <laughs> pro ITU takeover. Uh, I'm gonna get it where it's on Dana. Good afternoon, it's uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group LLC. And again, <clears throat> Rob, thanks for putting this together. I wanted to draw Francisco out uh, a little bit on a very interesting um, initiative that you've discussed that Commerce is working on. It's kind of, I think, probably working hand in hand with the Select USA, and this is the analysis of cost differentials uh, in investing abroad uh, versus the United States. I wonder if you might elaborate a little on that and have you validated that much with uh, business or received much reaction? Um, and then maybe just the last piece of the question. When you have, let's say there is a differential, let's say it's positive in our case, uh, what is your analysis of the ability of countries to do what Greg, also a very old friend of mine, uh, has described that Florida has done, which is to try to put a huge amount of money in there overcome that differential and still uh, get the investment in that country. Well, Dana, first, good to see you. Um, the That program that you make reference to is, I think, still uh, a bit of a work in progress. Um, and its primary purpose is not to make an investment decision for a company, but to put out information uh, as part of our efforts to promote the United States as a place to do business as a place to make investments, we want to give as much relevant information as possible. And that's really what that tool is. It's nothing more than just, it's another data point for companies that have to make that investment. And we are, I'd say we're ongoing getting feedback uh, from, from companies and 
other relevant players that can be helpful to that. Um, what I would say about uh, our overall efforts as a country, not just the federal government, is one of the things that does make us a bit unique is that we do have 50 states with economic development organizations, and most of them have invested money and resources uh, in attracting foreign direct investment. So Select USA is not intended to be a substitute for that. Uh, in many ways, I think that that has worked quite well. If you look collectively, our country does spend hundreds of millions of dollars in attracting uh, investment, <coughs> I should say, invests hundreds of millions of dollars in attracting uh, investment. And I think in many ways it works well precisely because Greg made a good point, that the closer you are to the community, um, the better you understand what makes a good investment by the state or by a community. Um, so we're going to continue to work very, very closely, not to replace uh, the very good, the very strong network we have of EDOs, economic development organizations, both at the state and the regional level, but to really complement those resources. And one of the things we'll do is we'll readily share what other countries are doing, both at, their, at the federal and state level, again, with the interest of sharing information that they can use to make their states, their communities more competitive. Here. Shank Singham with Squire Sanders. Um, good to see you again. And I uh, have a quick question on localization, which we'll talk about. Um, yeah. I think we're seeing around the world that the uh, negative impact of these localization policies, particularly on competition and, and therefore on consumers, is much less understood, I would suggest, today around the world than in the past, in fact. So the tide is going in the wrong direction. And some would argue it's going in the wrong direction, not only in the developing world, but in the developed world as well. So what suggestions do you have about how we can roll that back and start to make the consumer argument more, more effective? Is that to me? Sure, anyone. Why don't you start? Well, Shanker, good to see you. Boy, as more people raise their hands, I see I have a lot of uh, friends in the audience. It's good to see you. Um, I, I think that the, the first thing we need to do, we're already doing, and that is we engage our trading partners at every, uh, every chance we get to talk about the adverse consequences of localization, and we, we do it from the standpoint of its adverse impact on them. They would expect us to say, hey, you know, don't hurt uh, American companies in, in participating in your market, but we really do kind of take it from there. The global trade has become so uh, complex, and I know that as I say these, this, I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, but you make decisions on investment based on uh, not only where your customer is, but supply chain uh, economics, uh, where you have access to good talent, uh, where you, you have good academic institutions that, you know, that can help you in your research and development. So just throwing a, a policy on the ground and saying, if you want to build this particular thing here, um, if you think you're going to build an industry around that, you're crazy. <coughs> and I say that every time. I don't say crazy, but I basically uh, communicate that to them. So, I mean, we're doing that every step of the way. And then we're trying to formalize it in, in um, uh, agreements like the TPP and in, in the Information Services Agreement. And I think those are two very important ways. And then, quite frankly, I think industry can send a strong message by where they invest. And I know, uh, not to beat up on a country that I think is very beautiful and has been mentioned here a couple of times, but Argentina. I think Argentina is going to see companies that uh, might have made investments there not make them. And worse, I think they may see companies that are currently invested very slowly, very quietly uh, divest or move in different directions. So uh, I think there's a role for government to play. I believe we're playing it. And I think there's a very important role for industry to play. And I would echo that a little bit and also say I think there's a role for us to play together. Yep. So the we, sure. Um, I think there's a role for us to play together. So we are more often now when we are faced with those kind of indigenous innovation policies in a local country, reaching out to the federal government to say, look, we need your help. Um, we need you to advocate for the following. Let us give you a very specific example, not just of legislation, but as even down to the procurement level. Here's a specific example in a particular procurement, how this worked in practice, 
and how this not only hurts business in that country, but also hurts business more globally. So it, it's important, I think, that we not be running down parallel tracks. It's important for both of us to be running down our tracks, but we need to find places of intersect and we need to bring to the table for those who can advocate with the governments Here's some meaningful, real examples, not just of regulations, which they can read as well as we can and, and assess, but examples of how this worked in practice and how this hurt, in the end, the competition or the consumer in market. And that's something I think we're starting to do more and more, and we need to do more of. <coughs> Maybe take that one step further. Um, I think education is important, but uh, some countries show themselves uh, quite resistant to enlightenment. and. Uh, one idea that we floated last week, my colleague Stephen Azell did on our blog, which, uh, which with regard to India has ramped up PMA efforts, is to simply take away their GSP, uh, general system preferences we give them. We let them, because we, we thought they were a poor country who needed our help, so we let them get in our market with no tariffs, even though they have big tariffs, and these other things. So that's a, that's a next step. Uh, so we haven't gone that level, and I'd just be curious, Mr. Secretary, how do you think the openness is of the administration to maybe bring out the Teddy Roosevelt stick a little more? Well, as I look at some of my friends in the media that are out there, I want to assure you I'm not going to make news today. Um, you don't want to just say right now that's our policy? Yeah. Um, but look, I, I, I think that countries like India and Brazil, uh, to name two, that are in a very different place today uh, than they were 15, 20 years ago uh, when we started uh, certain trade talks. Um, and I think we have to be able to look at all tools in our uh, toolbox uh, when dealing with policies that are you know, just grossly unfair and, and hurtful, as you say, not only to American business, but uh, I think to the global economy, and in, even if they don't know it, to their own economy. So I, I would. I would just say that we need to keep all tools uh, at our disposal and, and, and open without suggesting that you know, we'll go in a particular direction today. How long have you been in government? Yeah. <laughs> that was a good answer. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go back here where I saw right there. Ken, I'm, I'm, I'm behind, you. You're behind you and then you. Know. Excuse me. Uh, Ken Jarbo, Athena Alliance. I want to pick up on something the Under Secretary said about working with the states. The good news is we have 50 states out there doing stuff. Bad news is we have 50 states out there doing stuff. Um, you know, back in the 80s, we tried to set up a, a, a joint program where you co-located what was the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service with the states. The problem we always ran into was the folks from the gov federal government said, hey, two states are going after this. We can't do anything. If two U.S. companies, you, you talk to ambassadors about this, if two U.S. companies are bidding on this, we can't do anything because that would be picking winners. Um, and we don't do that. Um, but so <coughs> what leverage do you have to curb those caps, those 50 caps? Well, the, the good news is I think the way that we are standing up Select USA, um, we, we still don't have to pick uh, winners and losers here. Uh, first and foremost, we share information. Two. We stay in regular and close contact with all EDOs that want to be active with us. And three, in the example you give, if there, if there are two states that are competing, we're still going to offer the same uh, services to that company. So the example I gave in my talk where we had a company that's making a substantial investment north of $10 billion, we're still going to sit them down with our other agencies and let them present what their investment is, uh, what their interaction with those agencies are going to be. We're still going to be able to do all that, um, even if they haven't quite decided if they're going to go to uh, New Orleans or uh, Wisconsin. I don't dare use my home state of Florida for fear you thinking I might be picking favorites. Um, but so I, I think there is a way for us to still play an important role. Um, and still maintain that neutrality. Because I, I can assure you, if I start pushing uh, a company in one direction when there are three, two, one or two or three other potential locations, uh, I'll spend the next month taking calls from governors, senators, and members of Congress. So we, we've got to strike that balance, and I think we've struck it. 
Okay, so I think we have time for two more questions if we keep the questions short and the answers short. So right here and then right, uh, right here. Michael Fitzmaurice, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and my question is my own, not my agency's. Uh, we've heard from this brilliant panel a lot on federal direct investment, uh, foreign direct investment, on uh, financial incentives, on the need to be competitive. Uh, and I'm wondering, I haven't heard anything about our health care costs or about pension costs. I wonder if that works into the competition equation or if we simply work faster on the financial incentives. Jennifer? It really does, I mean, it does to a degree um, factor in. I mean, we're a very old company, so we have substantial pension obligations. That's quite well known. Publicly, we've been very pleased uh, to be able to work with, with folks here in Washington with respect to our pension obligations. Um, so I would say that when we think through health care and pension, it, I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to say it doesn't come into the equation. It does, but it's not a driving, it's not a driving force for us anyway. Nor for us. Okay, thank you. And you have the last question. Well, the last question. Thank you. Uh, and to pick up from what Shane Can you identify yourself, please? Mentioned it. Sorry. My name is Bridget Matisson, the Washington Office of Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, and I thought for sure somebody else would raise this issue, but let me. Um, uh, on the localization programs and uh, for globalization, the, uh, uh, that issue of preference policies are alive and well in every uh, developed country as well. Um, we've been fighting by American, by American here in the U.S. for a long, long time. But I was particularly interested in your remarks, uh, Mr. Sanchez, about the uh, upcoming TPP. And in this country, the upcoming agreement with the EU for finalizing ours. Will, will Washington lead on procurement liberalization in the TPP? And I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, thank you for your question. And I appreciate your optimism in terms of the upcoming agreement between the U.S. and EU. Um, I think we, I'm very excited that we're moving uh, in, our, in our talks with uh, the EU, and I think that we're just starting. We still have a, a ways to go. Um, look, go government procurement is, uh, is very important to us. Uh, I um, probably one, one of the top five, six issues I raise with uh, countries that do put American companies at a disadvantage for government procurement is that they uh, sign on to the government procurement agreement of the WTO. And so um, we are, uh, we're going to always uh, move toward uh, more transparency, uh, more, as much of a level playing field as we possibly can. Um, is there going to be a, a, a perfect uh, policy? Probably not, but I can. I, I think I think I can say safely that it it is, it has been, and will continue to be a priority uh, to uh, be as open and transparent and as level as possible um, in uh, promoting government procurement practices that uh, are are competitive and fair. That's great. So I want to do two things before we close. One is um, to leave us on an optimistic note. Um, gentleman here had a sort of note of pessimism that nothing ever gets done. And I'm always reminded of Churchill's famous quote of in the midst of the war when the Americans were vacillating on entering on the Allies' side. Uh, Churchill once said, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> and uh, that seems to be the case here. We, we, we appear to be making uh, hopeful progress on high school immigration. We appear to be making hopeful progress on tax. Uh, it may be public investment, maybe the area where we don't seem to be making hopeful progress. It might be going the other way, but two out of three is better than zero out of three. So I think there are some um, positive things, both sides of the aisle and certainly in the administration, where we're moving forward collectively as a country to begin to win this race even more. Um, and with that, uh, if you are really just so focused and fascinated with this, I encourage you to come to our other event next Thursday on the Hill. Uh, where we have a really uh, another fantastic panel, um, Gary Pisano and Willie Shee, Harvard Business Review authors of a new book. We'll talk about our, st our book and the National Academy of Science talking about the new major study on innovation and competitiveness. So that's on our website. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and certainly give a warm uh, round of applause for our great speakers.